Welcome to Canadian Justice. I'm Christine Van Gogh. Today we're talking about employment law issues as some workplaces return to the office and others expand work from home policies. What types of issues are employers and employees running into as we navigate the new normal of work from home versus return to in-person work? Employment law is something that touches all of us who work. And it's important to understand your rights as employers and employees. Today, for this practical and timely conversation, we're joined by two employment lawyers, Mackenzie Irwin and Andrew Shaw. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Now, Mackenzie, let's start with you. Can you give us a sense of how many employers are currently moving back to the office full-time or even part-time? Is it most employers or... Or, or where are, where are we right now in 2023? Yeah, it's it's really a mix, actually. I'm finding that my impression is really that it's some employers are are recalling them back to the office, whether it's full time or on a hybrid model, a couple of days a week. And there are those employers that are still really appreciating that the work from home model, it's really worked for their employees over the past three years, and employee morale is up. So they're really sticking to that and allowing them to continue to work from home. So it really depends on the industry and the team dynamics in each individual team environment. Andrew, is there anything you want to add there on current trends of uh, return to work in person versus expanding uh, work from home policies? I would just emphasize that it does depend on the industry. Uh, as we know, you know, some jobs you just cannot work from home, but those individuals oftentimes, healthcare and such, uh, were always at the office or at the workplace during the pandemic. For those that have that were working from home during the pandemic, uh, I would agree that there's been a, definitely been a shift to a hybrid model where most employers are requiring anywhere from one to three days in the office. Um, so it, 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 I would say that being in the office five days per week for folks that were normally at home during the pandemic is, is, is pretty uncommon at this point. So, Andrew, what about these employers who are requiring the return? Can How does it work with requiring it? What types of you know, heads up to employees is required? Is there a heads up that's, that's required? Uh, what can you tell us about making that a required part of a job? that had been for two years done remotely? Sure, I think a reasonable period of notice in terms of return to work is definitely required, but can an employer require an employee who previously worked at the office to return? Yes, um, you know, there are certain uh, things that it, it impact that, like language in an employment agreement or what your workplace policies were, past practice was in the past. Uh, there's also things like human human rights laws, there may be disability issues that might have to be accommodated. Uh, there may be occupational health and safety issues uh, that have to be accommodated as well. Although, you know, saying that you think the workplace is unsafe due to COVID-19 probably would not fly at this point. Uh, but as a general proposition, an employer can ask employees to return to work. Mackenzie, what do you have to add to that? Anything you want to say about the, the mandate to return? Yeah, I think I think I agree with my friend. It's really important what's in the contract. So employees don't have an automatic right to work from home, but if you've been hired on a remote basis, on a permanently remote basis, and it's in your that term is in your contract, then likely that employer can't now change that term and require you to come into work. So it's going to be on an individual basis, and it's really going to uh, depend on. Uh, if there's any kind of accommodation issues as well. So there's a, a lot of factors at play here. Now, we, we've got to go to break, but in the next segment, I want to talk about some cases that we've seen in the employment law context related to work from home issues. There's a, a case that's been receiving a lot of attention involving something called time theft. Um, just in, in the time that we have right now, Andrew, can you just very briefly explain what the concept of time theft is in about 30 seconds before we get into what the case is about? Sure. Time theft is simply a concept where an employee is being paid to perform work and is not performing the work. Yeah. So this is, this is a really fascinating case. We're going to get into the details about exactly what happened, how common time theft is, and how common um, it is to catch time theft in a work from home environment where it might be a little more challenging. We are going to go to break, but we will be right back.
Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing employment law issues. Uh, now, Andrew, in the last segment, we were talking about this case involving time theft, where a it seems like an employee was let go with cause. She sued for wrongful termination, and then the employer countersued for time theft. Uh, and it seems like the employer came out ahead in this case. Can you explain what happened in that case? I think you've done a good job of explaining the basic facts. She was terminated for cause for time theft and uh, claimed wrongful dismissal damages, but the employer counterclaimed for wages that it paid to her uh, for the period that she claimed that she was working but was not. Uh, the tribunal ultimately dismissed the employee's claim and ordered her to pay the employer approximately $2,600 $2, in debt and damages for the time theft. Now, Mackenzie, how common is a claim for time theft like this? And how difficult is it generally to prove? I mean, basically, what should employees and employers know with a decision like this? What, what, what should they be aware of? So this is an example where the employer was very organized and really did cross their T's and dot their I's when they were creating this uh, just cause dismissal. So the thing, the important thing to note is that they had specific time tracking software that was able to track when this employee was working on certain files, what work was done and for how long. And in addition to that, they also did a very, a pretty thorough investigation into the discrepancies between what the employee's time entries were and what work she had actually completed. And they also thoroughly, you know, they had obtained an admission from the employee. So this is the, one of those rare cases where the employer really has done, the, done their due diligence and done everything necessary to really support their just cause dismissal. So it's not common. It's a very difficult threshold for an employer to meet, but certainly when an employee is claiming that they're doing work and getting paid hours of work for work they're not completing, an employer does really need to take action and, and make sure that they're really uh, thoroughly investigating and, and properly tracking and documenting what's, being, what's going on. Andrew, is there anything you want to add to that about the standard, how difficult it is to prove, or maybe even this issue of time monitoring software on an employee's computer. Uh, what should people be aware of about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think uh, Mackenzie's comment there about it being rare is exactly right because of the difficulty in actually being able to, to cogently prove that the time theft occurred. So in terms of, of how to potentially track that, I think that employers really should consider utilizing software um, for employees who are working remotely, uh, you know, if they believe there's a time theft issue or, or even if they're not. Um, so, you know, in terms of limitations regarding tracking that sort of productivity, generally employers are allowed to utilize software to track an employee's productivity as long as the software is not tracking and storing their personal information. Uh, you know, I, I would note, uh, as, as many folks know at this point, that under the recent amendments in the Employment Standards Act, there is an obligation for companies with 25 or more employees to have a written electronic monitoring policy that describes how and in what circumstances the employer may, may monitor employees. So that's important to have that policy, but it doesn't mean that you can't track. It doesn't mean that you can't uh, uh, implement that software as long as um, you're not uh, collecting personal information. Mackenzie, we've got about a minute and a half left in this segment. What other types of cases are we seeing arising out of work from home uh, employment? I'm actually coming across a lot of issues with jurisdiction. So what I mean by that is, for example, when an employee is hired to work for a company out of, for example, their New York City office, but throughout the pandemic, they've relocated and moved to Toronto. Uh, and now they work full time from Toronto, their employment is actually governed by Ontario employment law. It's no longer governed by the, um, the New York law that they were originally hired under. So when that New York City company now goes to terminate that employee, they're now subject to Ontario employment law and they're likely owed significantly more in severance than what the, the American company originally thought. And so I'm, I'm coming ac across a lot of instances where Employ companies have not really tracked where their employees have moved around throughout the pandemic. 
Yeah, I'm interested if if that is governed by the employment contract, because you stipulate in the employment contract that you can't move out of a certain jurisdiction. Uh, we've got to go to commercial break now. But when we come back, I want to delve deeper into those jurisdictional issues because, you know, I, I've heard about this happening quite a lot, actually. We will be right back. Welcome to Canadian Justice, where we are discussing employment law issues in the work from home environment. Now, Andrew, in the last segment, we were talking about jurisdictional issues. Um, I'm fascinated by this concept of an employee who accepted a work from home job, but may have relocated, you know, out of the province or maybe even out of the country, perhaps to a place where the employee, employer company isn't even registered to do business. So what types of implications are there for both the employee and for the employer in those situations? Yes, yeah, so I'm actually being asked about this frequently, um, and there are a lot of issues here. Uh, there is a bit of a differentiation if the, if the individual moves out of province versus out of the country, uh, but either way, it can be very complicated. First, employers need to understand that it matters where an employee is sitting doing the work, even if they're working from home or in whatever country they're in, it matters. So it, it whatever country they're in, whatever jurisdiction they're in, uh, as Mackenzie said uh, previously, the employment standards, legislation, human rights, uh, the law of that jurisdiction will apply to them. So employers need to understand that. And then there's also corporate law tax issues. There's very significant, to your point about the registration, there's very significant permanent establishment issues if the individual out of the jurisdiction is making decisions as an agent of the company and they do not have a registration in that jurisdiction uh, can create very significant tax issues. So I know a lot of employers, especially during the pandemic, but even now thought, oh, you know, it, it's no big deal. I can just let my employee work from anywhere. But it's really not true. Uh, and other issues include um, workers' compensation. So you have somebody working out of the province or out of the country. They may, depending on how long they're outside of the, the Ontario jurisdiction, for example, uh, they may become ineligible for WSIB benefits. So if they're uh, injured, if they're injured, correct. Yeah. If they, if they, if there's an accident or an injury uh, in the course of employment. So there's a lot of significant uh, issues there. And you raised a good point about, uh, you know, employment agreements. So what I've been doing with my clients in these cases is drafting an addendum to the employment contract to specifically deal with the period of time in which they're working outside of the jurisdiction. One of the things I think employees also need to be aware of relates to this uh, electronic monitoring. Mackenzie, it's possible if, if an employee does work outside the country or outside their jurisdiction without the authorization of their employer, that they, it, it's, they will be found out. Is that, is that accurate? And I think employees should be aware of that information if that's, if that's right. Yeah, absolutely. There are, um softwares, uh, tracking softwares that, that can advise the employer exactly where you're doing the work from. So there's definitely employer, certain employers do have that capability of tracking where you're at. So it's certainly something employees need to be aware of, but the uh, it should be disclosed to them in the electronic monitoring policy if it's an Ontario employer. Now, Mackenzie, I'm interested in, in you know, like temporary situations. Um, for example, if you're on vacation and you want to um, check check your email, respond to a few emails when you're on vacation in another country. Or what about um, a situation where a, a family member outside the country is sick and you want to go and visit them overseas? Can the employer say no? Is it better to uh, ask for forgiveness or ask for permission, especially if there's a risk that you you will be told no in those situations? So these situations, and it's, it's obviously this is new with the pandemic, people are moving around and, and more and more people have the ability to do their work remotely, but it's really a situation where the employer really needs to make sure that they have clear policies in place, addressing their expectations of employees when they're working from home. So if you have your, your employer's policy should state whether you have a, um, whether they're permitting you to, to work from remotely from another country whether there's um, 
statutory leaves and compassionate care leaves above and beyond the statutory minimum. That should all be addressed in the company's policy. And you need to make sure that the employees are aware of what the expectations are. If they're supposed to live, you know, be performing work a certain percentage um, out of a certain jurisdiction, that needs to be clearly communicated. And likely you should have your employees sign off on that so that they've all agreed and it, it's all, um, everyone's all on the same page and employees know what the expectations are. Andrew, anything you want to add to that in about 20 seconds in the time we have left? All I would say, that's exactly right. If it is a statutory leave that the employee is requesting, the employer should request reasonable documentation to confirm that. Um, and, and in terms of employee requests, you know, employees can't just request whatever they want um, and, and expect employers to immediately right. accept it. But if there is a statutory request, right. then, then it should be given due We've got to go to break, but we'll be right back. Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we're discussing employment law issues in the work from home environment. Andrew, what types of liabilities are there for companies in the work from home environment? For example, if someone is injured in a workplace, we know uh, that the workplace can be liable. There can be um, workers' compensation situations like that. But what if someone is, is injured at home and they work from home? And are there insurance policies for employees? working from home that a company would be obligated to get or should the employees be increasing their their insur their home insurance policies what what what's going on here with this sure yeah a great question the, you know the definition of the workplace is not necessarily limited to the physical location of the office um, and it can include place outside of the office um, even when somebody is on kind of a, a trip to visit clients um, so liability can potentially flow to the employer as a result of a work from home accident or injury. Uh, but it, importantly, it would have to occur in the course of employment, which you know, I, I, I guess in a work from home environment would be kind of up for debate, but um, that would definitely be a live issue. Uh, it, you know, If the employee is working from home and is injured in the course of performing their job duties, then that injury may be treated the same as if the employee was working in the office. Uh, so in a lot of cases, WSIB would apply and the employer would likely be covered. That's why I often say, even in if an employer is not uh, mandatory, it's not mandatory for the employer to have WSIB. I, I recommend it because it limits liability. In terms of of getting insurance policies for for workers, um, it, it, I I haven't seen kind of private insurance beyond WSIB or beyond what you know the health benefits uh, insurance that they already have. But it would be, depending on what work is being performed, um, something that uh, employers might want to consider. Mackenzie, I'm interested in the issues related to equipment. So most of us who work from home, our employers will pay, provide a computer. Uh, but what obligations are there for employers providing things like access to the Internet, which we are most of us pay for out of our own pockets, or things like uh, a, a desk. At the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of people were working from their kitchen tables. But as we've progressed and, and work from home has continued, do employ are employers more regularly providing office equipment um, and, and coverage for things like in internet access? So I think there, there needs to be a distinction made here. So there's a distinction between um, employees who are hired to work remotely from the outset. So those who are hired and those who were hired to work from the office, but then the employer then chose to move them to working remotely. So if you're hired remotely at the outset of the relationship, uh, the employer has made an offer to you. And for example, you know, here's what we're willing to supply or what we're not willing to supply. And it's really up to the employee to choose whether they're going to accept those terms or not. So in that situation, the employer doesn't need to provide you with the tools to do your work from home, uh, to pay for your internet. It's up to, it, it's really a negotiation between the employee and the employer, what they're willing to accept. But it's a bit different when the employer chooses to move the employee to working remotely. Um, and then the employer, I think, in that situation, they do have an obligation to supply the employee with, with the tools that are required to do the job. Um, and it's not really fair to make the employee pay for that. D you know, depending on the cost of those tools, 
uh, to the employee, this could impact their overall compensation, and it could turn out to be a constructive dismissal. So it's important to note that um, in those situations, the tools don't have to be perfect. Um, for example, if an employee wants an expensive chair over a, a regular chair, it doesn't need to be perfect. But I think in those situations, the employer should be providing uh, the tools. Andrew, one last question, which I get asked all the time. Can an employer for a re re remote employee require that employee to appear on camera? I get asked this all the time. We've only got about 20 seconds. Sure. I, I think if it's part of the job duties, I don't see any reason why an employer cannot require an employee to be on camera. Obviously, there's you know human rights issues, potential accommodation issues. But if uh, you know, you would have attended at the mm -hmm. office and in present. There's no difference with being on camera. When That's all the time that we have. Thank you both so much. We've heard today about the new challenges created by the move to and in part back from work from home employment. Employment law is an area of law that touches what many of us do. And if you have your own legal question or problem, you should consult your own lawyer. But what do you think of work from home generally? Is it the future? You be the judge. I'm Christine Van Gein, and remember, a freer Canada starts with you.